Um, I am uh, delighted today to welcome, or I guess more accurately, welcome back uh, to Georgetown to the Security Studies Program, uh, Dr. Jennifer Sims. Uh, Dr. Sims has had uh, numerous impressive jobs, and uh, including a number of senior intelligence uh, positions uh, in uh, the US government. Uh, I think the highlight of her career uh, was she was a, uh, a full-time faculty member with the Security Studies Program for four years, five years? 10 years. 10 years. Yes. Oh, gosh, that <laughs> makes me older than I think I should be. Uh, for 10 years, uh, where she headed our uh, intelligence studies efforts, among many other things. Uh, we're having her uh, here today to talk on her new book, uh, Decision Advantage, which I'm holding up for the camera, as well as for you all, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, it is both a... Uh, I'll say masterful history of intelligence, but um, in my view, uh, just as impressively, it's a, a masterful conceptualization of intelligence. And as I'm sure we'll uh, hear from Dr. Sims, um, how to think about what intelligence should and should not be, um, I'll say, how it should and should not be evaluated. Uh, so with that uh, brief introduction, um, let me ask you to join me in welcoming back Dr. Sims today. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, one thing Dan did not mention is that I am now a full-time artist. So I've made a massive career switch. Uh, although it isn't as massive as you might think because there are retired um, members of the CIA, very senior operations officers who've gone on to be artists, bookbinders, magicians, etc. And uh, there might be a lesson in there we could talk about later in the Q&A. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm very comfortable in the world of, um, of art and creative pursuits. And um, so if any of you are creatives, um, the intelligence community is in need of them. You have uh, some advantages in working in the intelligence function. It isn't just for uh, people, mathematicians and people with tech savvy, there's also a strong need for creatives. So I just put that pitch out there. Um, so why another book on intelligence? For goodness sakes, there are a gazillion of them out there, right? And they all purport to tell you what intelligence is, how it succeeds, how it fails. And then you get a slew of information from the press about the latest intelligence failure or success. Success in the case of Ukraine, perhaps failure in the case of domestic intelligence agencies trying to anticipate January 6th, which didn't go so well. Um, so how do we figure out what intelligence is and how it succeeds and fails so we can avoid the next disaster? And if you look at most academic writing, um, they'll be very, it's pretty pessimistic, right? Intelligence can never bat a thousand. Failure is part of the process. Um, there's also a, a shocking lack of intelligence um, uh, work in a lot of political science theory. Now, there's some exceptions, but the big schools on international politics and international relations, do they have a heavy dose of intelligence as a form of power? And yet we know when it fails, we can suffer drastic military defeats. How is it that we don't understand it as an element of power? And if it is an element of power, is it possible to measure it? We have muddy think thinking in all these regards. And we tend to be very self-reflective. If intelligence succeeds or fails, let's go ask the intelligence institutions how they screwed up or how they succeeded. Let's have a hearing and tear it apart and see what they did wrong or right. The notion there is that intelligence can be defined simply as what intelligence agencies do. You got a failure, go ask the intelligence community, how did they screw up? You got a success, give them a medal, you know? So <laughs> there, I am going to put out to you that we actually have very muddy thinking, despite all these books out there, we still have pretty darn muddy thinking about what intelligence is how you build it as a form of power, how you use it, who's doing it, and uh, it begs for a theory of intelligence. So this book is an effort to begin to get there by laying out how, first of all, three claims. One, 
I claim to define what intelligence is, how you know it when you see it, even if it's existing outside an intelligence institution as an activity outside an intelligence institution. The second claim is that intelligence is a measurable form of power. And in this book, I talk about how you measure it. And the third thing is that I make the claim that the way you actually can find out what, a, what intelligence is and how it's worked and not worked is to look at the centuries prior to the 20th and 21st century, to go way back in history. Because intelligence, any intelligence expert or, or academic will tell you, it's the world's second oldest profession. Right? It's been around for a hell of a long time. So what did we, how did, how did we, meaning humans, do it before we had the CIA, before we had all these intelligence institutions to blame, right, or to give medals to? How was intelligence done? And I, in this book, I choose um, four hard cases. Um, also, I chose four highly documented cases because I'm a political scientist, not a uh, historian. And so I wanted to ride on the backs of historians who had done an extraordinary amount of documentary work on these periods. And, uh, and then choose hard cases and fascinating cases in order to grab the reader so that you're marching along with me through the history of the Spanish Armada, two battles in the American Civil War, the run up to World War I, the July crisis, and the Munich crisis prior to World War II. And I throw in for good measure the hunt for John Wilkes Booth, which was a law enforcement um, endeavor, obviously, um, but done in the context of still an international crisis. You still had the Union and the Confederacy. The war wasn't over, um, but it was near over and Lincoln had just been shot. And so it, um, you had, you still had a government in the Confederacy, you still had a government. In fact, Washington DC, um, uh, William Stanton, who was then Secretary of War took over, pushed aside the vice president, took over and ran the hunt for John Wilkes Booth as a military endeavor. He saw it as part of the war effort, not a civilian enterprise for which he was later castigated, but that's another story. So it's law enforcement, in the context of war. And we have encountered a lot of that in our counterterrorism work. So it's important not to go in with mindsets, like law enforcement's one thing, national security policy and national security intelligence is something else. Um, so I threw that case study in. With these case studies, in almost every case, there's a lot of literature, there's very strong historical views on what happened, and in almost every case, intelligence is minimized as an important factor in what, in what happened or what ultimately happened. So um, what I want to do is walk you through just as an example, um, one of these case studies to talk about, and it's just gonna be skimming the surface. Teaser, buy the book, <laughs> in it, you're going to have a lot more in-depth analysis of how intelligence worked and didn't work. Um, but I define intelligence for the purpose of all these case studies as information for competition, the collection, analysis, and dissemination of intelligence for competition. The purpose of it is to help one side win. It's not thoroughly objective because its purpose is to help one side win. It's biased in that regard. And what it seeks is not massing the most amount of secrets. Um, its objective is not truth telling, although truth telling is an important ingredient. Its objective is to gain advantage over the other side, over the enemy, decision by decision by decision. And if your objective is truth, you'll keep working and researching long past when the information needs to arrive to make a good decision to beat the other side. It can be less than perfect information, less than thoroughly true, um, so long as it's better 
than what the other side has at any given moment. This doesn't mean truth isn't important or accuracy isn't important. It's all relative to what is necessary to give the decision maker enough of an advantage to win at that step in the competition. It's a very hard concept to understand because um, the intelligence community, especially in democracies, is built on an ethical foundation of we are the truth seekers. Find the truth, it will set you free, right? But held on too tightly as the standard for analysis and dissemination of product, it can keep you from getting enough information to the right person in time for the for gaining that advantage. Um, <clears throat> so the Armada. The Armada is a case of in, was a case of asymmetric warfare between the King King of Spain, King Philip II, and the Queen of England, um, Elizabeth I. He was Catholic in alliance with the Pope and wanted Catholic a Catholic Europe. The Queen, daughter of Henry VIII, was um, a Protestant, independent, and willful and weak. She had, you know, at the very start of her reign, there was a Protestant or a Catholic uprising in Northern England called the Northern Rising and it sought to unseat her. So she was vulnerable. And Philip II knew a lot about England or thought he did because he had been the husband of uh, Queen Elizabeth's sister, Mary Tudor, um, a sister by another mother. <laughs> <laughs> one of Henry VIII's um, other children. And she was Catholic. Philip II married her. They hated each other. She died. And he decided England was too cold and damp. He went back to Madrid and toyed around with proposing to Queen Elizabeth I. And she, it didn't work out. And starting in about 1570, they began to, uh, their slide towards war. In 1587, Queen Elizabeth took the decision to go to war. And in 1588, Philip II sailed his armada against her. The armada was, everybody expected Spain to win. Um, he knew England from his time on the throne. He had the best shipbuilders. He had the best Navy ever. He had um, the Duke of Parma with 30,000 troops in Spanish Netherlands ready to sail across um, uh, the channel and invade on foot. And the Armada was known, the Navy, the Spanish Navy was known as the kind of global trotting monolith. These were treasure fleets um, with incredible military capability. They had beaten the Turks. They you know, the, the Spanish army was the best and they populated these ships um, with the army and were going to just land on English shores and invade and topple the queen and the Pope was behind all of it. So what I call in this book, the terrain of uncertainty, we, the who knew most during this war, who was better resourced, who had better foundational knowledge, all goes to the Spanish. They had all the information on shipbuilding, all the capabilities, better maps, better admirals, you name it. They, they knew how to sail in blue water up and down the Mediterranean. They just dominated everything. And Philip II had a massive intelligence network combined with the Pope who had a massive intelligence network based on Catholic spots. Problem was that he didn't know how to fight in the channel, right? His galleons were not used to sailing up to the English channel. Who knew most about the English channel? The English did. So from a strategic intelligence perspective, super stupid, right? To take your, your ships good at sailing in the calm Mediterranean seas or shipping along known routes across the Atlantic Ocean, these treasure galleons um, with massive castles on them, huge ships full of soldiers, best soldiers in the world, but heavy 
heavy ships, not maneuverable. What did Queen Elizabeth have? Knowledge of her shores, merchant fleet that knew all the ports, all the sandbars, all the currents of the channel. They knew, um, they knew how the winds blew, when the bl winds blew, you know, at particular times of day, the channel was a tricky, tricky uh, uh, place to sail. And in addition, she had a special intelligence relationship with pirates, in particular, Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake had terrified Philip II by, by circumnavigating the globe in a small little ship. But Philip, I mean, um, Drake also had had a run in with Philip and it, he never forgot it. He was his small little fleet of traders was um, attacked in a surprise maneuver and the English ships were wiped out by the guns of the um, uh, Spanish ships in close quarters. They were boarded and he got away by the skin of his teeth. He learned from that the vulnerabilities of the Spanish ships and the vulnerabilities of the English ones and convinced, along with John Hawkins, who was his fellow pirate, convinced Elizabeth I to completely rebuild her navy. And he did that in the 1570s, long before the queen knew that she was going to have to fight in the channel. And this is important because one of the biggest problems we have in intelligence is strategic intelligence. How do you do it? This was an amazing example of a liaison between a government, Queen Elizabeth I, and a renegade uh, pirate slash privateer. She funded him. She could barely control him, but she could fund him and they had an agreement. And so he went and he did these little pinprick attacks against Philip II. But more importantly, he and John Hawkins came up with a new design for ships that the Spanish learned about eventually, but not in time to redo their whole fleet, which is called getting inside the intelligence cycle of the other side. So before the Spanish could change how they built their ships, having learned what the English had done, they didn't have time to change it. So they just went with their old galleons. Meanwhile, the English had smaller ships, lighter ships, more maneuverable ones, and much better guns. So when it came time for them to have the engagement in the channel, the Spanish were like sitting ducks. They didn't have English pilots that knew the ports. They didn't have a good strategy for dealing with the more maneuverable ships. Um, they were uh, stuck. There were other, there were, this is a, a huge oversimplification of what happened, but it is the crux of what happened. And if you read the book, in the, there are many other ways in which Elizabeth outwitted Philip II based on information she was getting from her own Catholic spies under Sir William Burgley, who was Cecil Burgley, who was her Catholic um, Privy Council member, and uh, Sir uh, Walsingham, who was her Protestant. And they were visibly at odds with one another. And they gave her drastically different intelligence, politicized intelligence. But she was savvy enough as a decision maker to listen to both of them and keep them both close to her. And she knew, in fact, she wouldn't have trusted them if they weren't political or politicized. Um, so politicization back in those days was not a bad thing. Everybody was politicized. What the savvy decision maker did was get all those political viewpoints um, as backed up with information to make their case as possible. And then she heard it all, processed it, and decided what she was going to do. So um, the takeaways from, from this are, um, first of all, when you go into a competition, you want to understand the terrain of uncertainty and develop a strategy that puts what you know foundationally um, into the priority box. So if you're going to fight, fight on ground you know. 
you know, bottom line. One of the big advantages Ukraine has in the current situation, everybody was discounting Ukraine. Russia's gonna overtake Ukraine and, and beat them, silly. Didn't happen. Part of the reason is that Ukraine was fighting for its own turf, so that affects willpower, but it's also the knowledge of the terrain that counts. Um, when am I supposed to go to, by the way? About 4.30. About 4.30. Okay. All right. Um, so Philip blundered by deciding to fight the English in their own in their own domain. He didn't really know the channel. He expected that his admirals would be able to deal with it. Um, he just expected muscle to matter more than intelligence. Uh, his strategic plan was very bad for other reasons as well, um, which we don't have time to go into. But the key one was that he was fighting on really chosen ground. And he knew the English had developed a Navy that could outmaneuver him, but he didn't come up with a counter strategy for how he was going to deal with it. He was just planning to force his way in and land somewhere. The English, all they had to do was outmaneuver these ships and keep them from landing anywhere along the English coast. They didn't need to know exactly where he was landing. This was the great Spanish secret. The English aren't gonna know where we're gonna hit them. But the English strategy had nothing to do with that. They weren't planning to mass a land army at his invasion point. Their entire plan was to outmaneuver the ships to prevent them from landing. And Philip II didn't bother with that. Now, why did Philip II not bother with any of that? And one reason is that he just expected that God was gonna be on his side. He was a fervent Catholic. He thought he was taking on a Protestant queen who uh, you know, had angered uh, the Pope. And so he thought it was pretty much gonna be the essentially God was gonna have his back. Let's put it that way. So as intelligence rolled in that things weren't going well, he stayed the course. Uh and the Armada was soundly defeated. So there are a number of takeaways from this. And when we look at a case study like this, um, and I mentioned we can measure intelligence power, we want to ask ourselves, what are the overall takeaways from this? How do you build intelligence power? How did Elizabeth I build her intelligence power? What are the key ingredients of it? Well, I don't have time to go through all the case studies, so I'll give you after ha having gone through all the, all the case studies in my book, I came up with four. And there are four critical elements to intelligence power. And unfortunately, when you're today trying to figure out what to do uh, about an intelligence question, you can't <laughs> compare what you know to what your enemy knows as easily as we can do when we look back on a case study and say, okay, the queen knew that, Philip knew that, here was Philip's mistake, here's the queen's advantage. You actually don't know what the other side is doing. So all you can do is measure your own side. And one big takeaway from this book is never get into the business of thinking that intelligence is just about what you're doing. Because if you think that you have to gain advantage, that means you have to know that you're doing better than the other side. So there's a constant a reminder to keep counterintelligence in mind, to keep your head in the head of the enemy, figure out whether or not you know enough uh, to win at any point. But if you want to build up your intelligence readiness, so no matter what an enemy is throwing at you, you want to optimize four things. What are they? They are the elements of intelligence power, in my argument. The first thing is collection capacity. Now, Oh yeah, everybody's gonna say, of course. But actually, we have institutionalized in the United States the supremacy of all source analysis as the highest kind of endeavor that we do. Decision makers rarely get raw collection for a good reason, um, but estimative intelligence has become the holy grail. If you told Queen Elizabeth I that estimate Estimate of intelligence was the holy grail for her. She'd boot you out of the throne room, right? 
for her, the most important thing was collection and raw collection frequently because she didn't always trust the political overlay underneath. Um, we have we have to think sensibly about uh, the importance of showing decision makers the 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 uh, sources on which the estimate of judgments are based, and to push some of that information forward. Uh, because if we're not, there's a trust issue, which gets to a later point, but that I'm going to make. But collection is has as a result, and collection management and management of collection systems is one of the things we think about too late when we're in analyzing how intelligence succeeds and fails. We tend to go straight to the analysts, and there's a danger there. What are the ingredients of collection? Platforms, sensors, processing and exploitation, and data exfiltration. There are four elements. Those four elements make up collection systems. Sir Francis Drake and Queen Elizabeth shared command and control over his, his ships. He was systems manager for naval collection to an extraordinary degree. He hired his pilots, he hired his crew, he made sure his platforms, his ships were running, and he was a collection manager par excellence. Worth studying him. You want to know how to how to run a collection system? Study Sir Francis Drake. He had he nailed it for a lot of reasons. Um, the business of collection management is organizing, um, combining, and uh, back and forth these four elements of collection, finding sensors that you can put on different platforms, um, processing and exploitation that can handle maybe several uh, platforms at the same time. Data exfiltration is different than command and control. It's can you get the information off the platform, no matter where it is, back to the decision maker. Um, so a basic, easy way to judge who has an intelligence advantage at any more moment is to count the collection systems on either side. Now we are all biased towards counting things, but like with military hardware, where you're trying to figure out which is the stronger military power and you collect, you add up the tanks and you add up the aircraft carriers and et cetera you can add up the collection systems and figure out how well those four components of collection are organized and managed and how good the central management is among all those collectors so that you can mix and match sensors across platforms. And you have a pretty good indicator of how strong an intelligence service is. You can't be biased into thinking that the only platforms that count are the ones owned by the intelligence community. For example, our embassies worldwide are intelligence platforms, whether you want to admit it or not. Ambassadors are the Sir Francis Drakes of those platforms. Either they are smart and savvy about mixing and matching the sensors and platforms, uh, the sensors and processing and exploitation and data exfiltration, either they're good at doing that or they're not. And you weaken yourselves if you put in somebody political who doesn't understand that mission for diplomatic reporting and intelligence management and liaison with the military and country, et cetera. State Department is a platform manager, whether you like it or not, and it sits outside the intelligence community. And most of its operations budget is outside the intelligence budget. And it's been going down and has not been increasing at the rate it should, given um, the demands on US intelligence. So collection is number one. Number two is what I call anticipation. And you measure that by the degree of, of independence of the intelligence requirements process um, from the political process. And by that, I mean, we are, in the intelligence community, we talk about how cu the customer is king. What policymakers want is what the intelligence community goes and gets. But that would mean, in the case of Philip II, that the intelligence community's only job is to go out and find out, for example, what the um, uh, you know, how 
the the um, channel is flowing and what the sandbars are, et cetera. They wouldn't be asking anything that he was uninterested in, like what's the English strategy with their ships? What it what is this new race built galleon? What are they what are they planning to do? Why do they not seem to care about what we call the secret, which is our landing point in England? He didn't ask those questions because he didn't care about them. But if he had a good intelligence service who wanted to anticipate what the English would do, they would go get the answers to that question anyway. So if your intelligence service has the capacity to develop an independent set of requirements, yes, answer the inbox, but also find out what the unexpected is, what policymakers for some reason aren't interested in. That's where you win in strategic warning. Number three, the transmission function. And there are other little, I don't have time to go into all the little ticks that are in the book on, on how you measure the anticipation or strategic intelligence function. Number three, transmission. And transmission is how close the decision maker is to the intelligence professional. Now in the United States, we have a cultural red line in intelligence. On the one side is intelligence, on the other side is policy, and that red line shall not be crossed. From my research, and this was something that I wasn't expecting to find, but in every case study, it turned out to be true. The closer that the intelligence officer can get to the decision maker, in fact, when they're one in the same, George Washington, for example, um, was his own intelligence officer in the Revolutionary War. Um, there are, uh, Winston Churchill was as well. When decision makers get really, really good at collecting intelligence themselves, and when intelligence officers get really, really good at getting into the head of policymakers, even to the extent of arguing about which way to go in a policy <laughs> argument, you are beginning to get develop a couple of things. Trust, the capacity to see a problem through the eyes of a policymaker, which is necessary to figure out what you need to know in order to decide whether to take that one course or the other. The military are much, much better at this. They have their J2s who go into battle right with them. And should I take this hill or that hill? The J2 will answer the question, you know, in terms of the intelligence he's got. Not and not in every case, but oftentimes. And that is something that in the best instances, if you if you ask a negotiator, you know, somebody who's negotiated with the Russians on uh, issues of nuclear proliferation, for example, uh, or the North Koreans, or in the Middle East, negotiators who have on their team an intelligence officer who will get in the thick of all the debates that are going on and what should we do next? Tomorrow we have another negotiation. What do we do? The trusted intelligence providers are the ones that don't say, uh, uh, don't ask me, I'm just sitting here. I, I'll give you information if you ask me a question, but I'm not, you know, no, I don't do that. And then they're, then they get relegated to the side. They're not as, as, as trusted. The way to measure it is whether intelligence and policy flows across the divide. If decision makers are permitted to see the most sensitive intelligence, and if policymakers tell their intelligence officer what their most sensitive decisions are and what their most sensitive calculations are, you know that the proximity is close enough that there's going to be the ability to get intelligence to the decision maker in time. The other thing is um, in the transmission function is a capacity in the intelligence community to identify who's making the decision. So prior to 9-11, once the, the terrorists were in the air, if the intelligence community couldn't get intelligence to the people who could decide to ground the planes, then the intelligence community couldn't do anything, right? If all they could do was knock on the door of the National Security Advisor, as opposed to going to the uncleared mayor of New York City or whatever, you, you've hamstrung 
maybe for a good reason, but you've hamstrung the intelligence community in that third critical function, which is the transmission function. And fourth and finally is a capacity for selective secrecy. And no one in this room needs to be told that we are overwhelmed with secrets and a, a broken classification system. And we know that because we can't declassify fast enough. And we are we treat open source intelligence as if it doesn't give us any advantage. Open, you can have, so long as all the sources are open source, it can be published for the world. So we have NIEs <laughs> that are produced by a secret intelligence budget in this country that no one, you and I can't get access to because we don't have, um, you know, we don't have the right clearances. And, uh, you know, the NIC, the National Intelligence Council will produce a global um, futures product that is unclassified and based on only open sources and they've spent how many gazillions of those secret dollar, dollars on this unclassified product? Why is the intelligence community producing, using secret funds, unclassified products? It's a waste of money. If we want to have a global analysis of the future, have another have the State Department do it on an unclassified basis. But to have secret dollars in a democracy going to publish an unclassified document based on open sources that provide no advantage to the United States in any international competition because the Russians can buy it. In fact, the Russians were interviewed as part of the unclassified product. Then, you know, we've gone down a strange rabbit hole when, when we're using secret dollars to essentially have a government unclassified newspaper. So, I'm off on a bit of a tangent. I will wrap it up there. Those are the four elements. Um, I haven't talked yet about counterintelligence, but counterintelligence is simply policy, the policy of undermining your competitor's ability to know what you know. So, and it is to so disadvantage in the other side. If the purpose of intelligence is to gain advantage for your own side, purpose of counterintelligence is to provide disadvantages to the other side. The exception to that is when you're working against a, and this is getting a little arcane, a foreign intelligence service that you want to be smarter than it is. Because for example, in war with a, an enemy that doesn't know it's being defeated, you want it to learn it's being defeated. So you'll share intelligence with them. You know, you're being defeated. I'm gonna make you, your job easier, enemy. I'm gonna give you the information so you know you've lost. That is improving the intelligence of the other side, but for your own advantage. So it gets a little arcane. But anyway, I will close on that note and let's talk. Uh Fantastic. That's a great foundation for us to um, have our conversation. Um, I'm going to kick off with one question before I open it up to everyone. Um, so, appropriately, this is a book about intelligence, but um, as you've stressed, uh, so much of this is really on the policy side and the transmission of information back and forth. Um, how do, and if you don't mind answering this in, in a contemporary sense, how do you make policymakers smarter? On intelligence, right? If you're saying, okay, the intel community, here's lessons for you, but what would you what would you tell the policy community about intelligence? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I'd say own it, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's yours. And if you want an advantage in decision making, not only against your international folks, but let's be frank, policy making inside government is a competitive enterprise too, right? You want, you've got a colleague in the Defense Department that's arguing policy one way. You're in the State Department, you're arguing policy another way. You want to be able to make as good arguments as the person in, in the Defense Department so your boss will go your way and eventually the president will go your way or whatever. In order to make those arguments, you need to be informed. And so you need to have a way of tapping into the intelligence community and learning how it works and how you get your requirements met. 
Um, when I was in the intelligence community, we used to call it the belly button. Where is the belly button for the intelligence community for each decision maker? Surprisingly enough, there are very senior people in government who haven't a clue how to, how to even approach the intelligence community. That all they do is sit passively and wait to be briefed. You know, nobody ever won an internal policy making competition or an international uh, uh, conflict <clears throat> by sitting pa passively waiting for information. <clears throat> so there is a structural need to um, to train, not just on the intelligence side, but on the policy side, train people uh, on how to use intelligence and become intelligence officers themselves. I think general schedule employees, senior executive service employees ought to spend time in the intelligence community and have intelligence training to some degree and vice versa. It should not be seen as a great divide between these two communities. Um, it also is really useful to spend time on the Hill, frankly, because hearings involve um, understanding, you know, gathering information, what do we need to hold a hearing? and then using that information for pointed questions to experts. And that whole process of how you get information in the federal government is extremely instructive. So some of the most effective executive branch uh, professionals I met had spent some time on the Hill and understood these things. Now, I come from an era where there was bipartisanship on the Hill and things may be much different but I need to also mention that uh, there's a natural progression that has happening. As the internet has penetrated our society more and more, people are beginning to be their own researchers for better or for worse. So back in the day, when I was in the intelligence community, people had to be trained on technology. Now people are coming in with a mindset on how to get information off social media and open sources. And so what, in addition, needs to be taught is critical thinking and how to keep from being misinformed through open sources. So it's got a twofold answer. Thank you. Uh, let me open it up to everyone. And I just ask you, you say your name before you ask your question. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Margaret Jones. I'm on my fourth semester at SSP. And um, you talked a lot about this relationship between intelligence and policymakers and um, you just brought up how uh, policymakers need to be informed on the intelligence cycle. How would you advise um, oftentimes when like feeling like the policy is driving the intelligence and kind of getting out of that rut where you want to maybe challenge some of these assumptions that policymakers might have or that, um, you know, like how to avoid uh, as an intelligence agency or an intelligence analyst, how to avoid getting stuck in kind of the rut of uh, doing what you think the policymakers want and not what you need? Well, that's an excellent question. It comes from good management. A lot of this book is aimed at intelligence policy managers because if you allow a culture to evolve where the customer is king, you get um, an unwillingness on the part of the analyst to take risks, to look for new questions to ask and um, come forward with answers that um, to, uh, to questions that were never asked or were asked the wrong way. And what you want in your decision maker is somebody who is open, this gets back to Dan's question, who's open to that. Because if you're a decision maker and you presumably want to win, then you don't want to do stupid things. But in a way, the intelligence community is not built to make decision makers smarter in that sense. Unfortunately, the intelligence community serves the policymakers. So if the policymakers are deciding between three options and they're all stupid, and there's a fourth option that's much better, and you've done the analysis to show that there's a fourth option, but they have said, we're not interested, we want intelligence just on these three. You can't, by standing up 
after a certain point by standing up to the policymaker and saying, you're going the wrong road, you're going the wrong way, you're not being helpful <laughs> at some point. And this is where we can get easily off the, the rails because there are, when you get into a <clears throat> truth seeking mindset, then the, then it's easy to say the policymaker is wrong and we're going to prove it. And after we've proven it, if they still don't get it, we're going to beat this dead horse. And that's how you end up damaging the trust, the transmission function. Remember when I talked about the proximity, the trust, what you need to move is the decision maker incrementally to see the light. But it isn't the intelligence community's fault if the policy is stupid. The intelligence community is supposed to try and make it a little bit smarter and a little bit uh, uh, more informed, but you can't fix stupid out of the intelligence community. And the problem becomes if the public begins to see intelligence institutions as not only the seekers of truth, but the guardians of the gate. So intelligence is is put on a pedestal and policymakers are blamed, you're not only going to draw, make intelligence no longer trusted by the policy community, you're heading down a road that's very dangerous in a macro sense because nobody in the intelligence community is elected. You, are, The intelligence community is not um, composed of people who uh, represent the people in any way. All you represent is the ability in the intelligence community to get information for the people who were elected. And you might not like their policies, but you still got to help them by their own lights win the fights they choose to fight. That's who you are. You're not a gatekeeper in any larger democratic sense. Sad to say, but there are other mechanisms for that. We have other branches of government for that. Yeah. Hi, my name is Clark. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Um, you talked a lot about how important it is to have communication between the policymakers and intelligence and kind of following that up. In the modern world of you know, suffocating bureaucracy, it's hard to imagine such an effective transmission of information. Is there an example that we can pull from in creating those systems? Is there something that you have in mind when you talk about that transmission? The proximity um, of intelligence uh, analysts and collectors to decision makers. Familiarity sometimes causes problems, but in the most in most cases, and particularly in this business, getting as close as possible. So when there are these proposals that come along, oh, you've got so much intelligence bureaucracy. Let's all consolidate it. Why do we have an INR, a DIA? you know, an intelligence shop and DOE, an intelligence shop, they are just too many. The answer is INR, which sits, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, which sits inside the State Department as its in-house intelligence provider. It is more trusted in general than any of the other agencies by State Department officials because there is the day in, day out interaction. Sometimes the CIA and the, the National Intelligence Council tried to do this, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The National Intelligence Council sits at the top of the, um, all the analytical bureaucracies, and you have NIOs, National Intelligence Officers, and NIMS, National Intelligence Managers, who are supposed to be the belly buttons I talked about for on issues. So if you're doing nonproliferation, say, you go to the NIO for nonproliferation and, and WMD, and you have a question about what the intelligence is in the US government on North Korean nuclear weapons or whatever, you go, you go there. Now that NIO is gonna be pretty busy because he's answering those questions. And, but he's the smartest person supposedly knows the views of the whole community. And the NIM knows all the collection. NIM is responsible for all the um, sources and methods that led to that body of knowledge that the NIO and the NIM have on that topic. But that gives them the expertise. It doesn't mean that they are the trusted, close advisors. Some of them develop that relationship 
but they're so busy that they sometimes get stuck in the bureaucracy across the river. These little shops inside the policy bureaucracies, that's where you start. And they build the trusted relationships supposedly within their own departments. And sometimes they're criticized for being politicized. But my argument is the Queen Elizabeth I and Philip II case show you that a little bit of politicization isn't that bad if it builds trust. And, um, you know, you look at INR and yes, they tend to see the diplomatic point of view more often than not. They tend to be a little bit more biased and, and INR would say, no, we're not biased, we're not biased. But, you know, you ask people and yeah, I think you tend to side a little bit more with a diplomatic point of view. But that's because they're in the room all the time talking to those policymakers and you want them there. So if I were going to design an intelligence community, I wouldn't get rid of those little shops. I wouldn't save the money by consolidating it all in CIA. Big mistake. So proximity, encouraging a lot of interaction, but not going too far. And that's, that's the trick. The red line is not stupid. It's just too wide. There needs to be a sensitivity. Um, otherwise, intelligence will be blamed for policy outcomes and intelligence officers will start making policy and then you're in a world of hurt too. So it's a sensitive relationship. I just think we've gone a little bit too far um, at times in the, in the line of division as opposed to proximity. Thank you. I'm going to make this our last slide. Yes, please. Um, I'm Gitanjali, I'm an undergraduate in the SFS studying SUDA. Um, you spoke a little bit about how Queen Elizabeth wouldn't have trusted her Protestant and Catholic intelligence officers if they weren't politicized. So in an increasingly dangerous culture of politicization, what role do you think that bipartisanship plays for everyday employees in the IC? Uh, well, I think, um, I think you can't have bipartisanship unless you have partisanship. So you need to be able to get in the heads of people coming at you from both sides and um, not becoming a tool for partisans, but um, understanding both sides. And sometimes it's not just two sides, there are three, four, five sides to an issue. Um, and being able to get in the head that answer the question of why they're asking the question of you that they're asking it. And um, you know the the matter the issue of trust is not you don't build trust just by agreeing with somebody. You know syncophants aren't trusted. They you know he's gonna tell me what I want to know. I don't trust him. Right? So you're not looking to be a partisan too. You're looking to understand what the problem is that this person is trying to solve and what the information is that they need to have and do it for all sides. Now there's a an article that was written at one point um, about, uh, I can't remember his name now. He was in, in the Department of State and he was what we call a black belt bureaucrat. And he only wanted intelligence um, he wanted his own team of intelligence officers He's from CNN. Yes, Bob Blackwell. Yeah. Yes. And he called him his intelligence hog. And the reason he called him that was at the time the Redskins had a front line. They were a winning team back then. <laughs> and they had a front line defense, right? That, that, driver, yeah. that were called the hogs. And they were these huge guys. And they defended um, really, really well. And so he wanted, as he put it, his own intelligence hogs, people who would hog the intelligence for him and defend him from all the other bureaucrats trying to beat him in the influence game inside the State Department, the Defense Department, inside the National Security Community. He wanted his own team of intelligence officers who were loyal to him and only him and saw the world the way he saw it, answered the questions he had got all the information ahead of everybody else, including his competitors in the bureaucracy, and he wanted to own them. Um, and I used to teach intelligence here, and I would ask my students, what do you think of that? Is that a legitimate use of the intelligence community? And some students said, oh, heck yes. You know, you've got a, a policymaker who loves intelligence, wants intelligence, has requirements, it's articulated about, about a, 
and uses intelligence officers and gets them in the room. And I said, but what happens if, you know, as a result, his he wins all the bureaucratic arguments, even though his solutions were not the best, but he was just had the better intelligence so he could trump everybody else. And the upshot of it was that everybody ought to have their, their hogs. The ideal for the intelligence community is where you empower every single decision maker to know how to get intelligence, to believe he's got a team supporting him or her, and that they won't let down, that that team won't let down the team <laughs> they're serving. And that goes back to why we have these units inside each bureaucracy. Because in INR, for example, INR regards it as, as the State Department almost to a fault as their domain. They will make sure that the Department of State has the best intelligence possible. And each one of the policymakers will have a special service um, from INR. But INR will also, if one policymaker in the State Department cuts out INR and runs to DIA and finds a couple of other people to provide intelligence so that he can or she can beat other diplomats in the State Department, INR steps in and says, whoa, 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 because you're mistaking something here. We work, INR works for the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is not interested in having one person in the State Department working to undermine the capability, the intelligence capabilities of all her other assistant secretaries. So if one assistant secretary has managed to engineer this little team of hogs like Bob Blackwell, so that he or he can have the most influence with the secretary of state, that's not in her interest. She wants all her assistant secretaries to have their team of hogs. What ensures her that she can have that? INR, because INR is sitting there making sure that nobody is trying to manipulate or distort the intelligence feed coming into the department of, as a whole, and they're accountable to the Secretary of State for okay. that. So INR is both trusted, but also um, at times uh, uh, a source of friction for diplomats who want to do a runaround and, and get better intelligence for themselves. And so INR plays that dual role, which is really important to keep privatization or personal interests or partisanship from overtaking the whole system? It's a complicated answer, but I hope it answers your question. Um, uh, wonderful session and a nice way to end. Uh, before we go, I should have added that uh, Dr. Sims has several copies of a book that I believe I just say. Just three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, of course. <laughs> Uh, but if um, any of you are interested, uh, please come up afterwards. It's also on Amazon, so you don't need to do it now. Um, I highly recommend it, though. Uh, <laughs> but before we all go to our classes and evening activities, uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Sims for a fantastic presentation. Thank you.